in process dynamics and controls, we need to be able to derive equations that relate how the process variables or the variables that we're controlling change with respect to time. And what we're going to do in this video is we're going to learn how to derive the dynamic form of the energy balance and then also the dynamic form of the you know, balances for the concentrations of the relevant species in the reactor. So if we have a process, a chemical reactor, where into the reactor we feed our reactants, and for this example here, I'm just going to focus on the simple reaction of A goes to B, um, and fed to the reactor is going to be um, species A, so we can describe this as I'm going to use um, Fa naught, and Fa naught is a molar flow of the given species. And typically, a reactant will be in a solvent, and so we'll have the molar flow rate of the solvent entering the system, and it'll be entering at a given temperature. Um, and exiting the reactor is going to be some of the unreacted products. So we'll call that the molar flow of species A. We'll have some of the product, the molar flow of species B. Um, the same amount of solvent should exit, so we'll write FSO, and then the reactor is going to operate at a given temperature, which will be the temperature of the outlet stream. Um, in a reactor, we can also have stirring, so this might involve some sort of shaft work, and we can also do heating. So, for example, we could heat via, we could have steam that's added, uh, or heat can be added to the reactor by steam or electric or we could remove we could remove heat using cooling water. So those are uh, a couple of the examples of, of things that can happen. So our overall energy balance for this system is, um, as in any equation, any conservation equation, we know that energy can't be created, but we can accumulate energy in the system. So we have a rate of energy accumulation in the system, that's going to equal the energy that enters due to flow. So we have we have the energy in, and this is due to flow, and this is based on the species that are entering and flow work, uh, minus the energy um, out of the system due to flow in a game, same sort of thing, um, plus any sort of energy that's transferred across the boundaries. So we'll call this energy transfer across the boundaries. So this is our general form of the, the conservation, um, <clears throat> conservation equation for energy. And so now what we need to do is we need to take this convenient form, this, um, this known conservation equation, and we need to put it in terms of measurables. Um, so the rate of energy accumulation in the system, we can express that as um, the rate of change, so the derivative of, and I'm going to write this as m u hat, and u hat is an intrinsic form of the internal energy, which means something like kilojoules per kilogram. So this is the rate of change of the total internal energy. And for this system right here, for chemical processes, reactors that involve heat exchange, typically um, the 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 energy change due to kinetic and or potential energy are negligible. So I'm ignoring those in both the accumulation term and the energy associated with the species entering and exiting. So we're just considering, you know, energy due to um, the internal energy changes. So the energy that flows in is going to be the sum of the molar flow rates in times the enthalpy in. So the sum of all of those terms, and again, Fi is the molar flow rate, so that would be something like uh, moles per time, and then the H hat would be internal enthalpy. Note that enthalpy equals U plus PV, so this is the combined internal energy plus flow work. So the sum of that entering minus the sum of the same thing going out, so Fi times Hi out. <clears throat> and then plus any sort of energy that can transfer across the boundaries. And we can treat that as things like shaft work um, plus Q. So Q would be heat added or heat removed. Um, for this example right here, typically the amount of work due to stirring is small. So we're going to say that the shaft work is negligible, but we could keep it in there. It's just a constant, and it would be something that we could know or measure. 
All right. So one of the things to note that all of these terms in here need to be kilojoules per second, or in other words, kilowatts. So if we look at each term, we have the first term is the internal energy is going to be kilojoules on the top and then time on the bottom. And then that'll flow, uh, hold true for each, each of these terms. All right. So if we have steam, so if we have uh, this Q term, um, if we have Q, so from a you know fluids or heat transfer class, if if this Q is from steam, we know that this Q is going to be something like U H or the overall heat transfer coefficient times the heat transfer area multiplied by the temperature of the steam minus the temperature of the system. So typically, um, steam is condensing, so that the temperature of the steam is going to be the same within the steam shell, and then once it saturates, it's it's able to exit. So that will be constant. But if we have Q due to cooling water, we might need to do something like a U <coughs> heat transfer area. We might use a, need to use a, a, a delta T log mean. And, and these are things that you may have seen before. But in this case right here, we're just going to, we're going to look at um, the heating with steam or no heating at all. All right. So our next task is now to put these terms, um, these each of these terms in the equation um, in terms of measurable based on our system. So again, we're looking at our system. We have the things that are entering here. So we have um, A, S, species A, S, and then the things that are exiting, we have F, F, A, we have species B, and we have species not, or species um, a solvent. All right, so our first expression now for this, this first term, um, I'm going to leave this M. I could express M in terms of rho V, so the density times the volume of the tank, or I can express it in terms of M if I just know the total mass that makes up the reactor. So again, our, our system is going to be the reactor right here. So this, in this first term, our accumulation is the accumulation that's occurring in the reactor. Now, if we treat the system as steady state, like you may have done in a material and energies balance class, this term would be zero. But we know that in real chemical processes, the temperatures can change. And so we want to know how they change in response to um, you know, either heating or, or flow rates or temperatures and things like that. OK, so let's see. So because you know, we're going to assume in this example right here that the, the mass of the tank is going to remain fairly constant. So when we look at our assumptions, the mass is constant. And so what also what that means is that generally the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate in equals the volumetric flow rate out. And again, the mass, the, the, the level of the tank will probably be controlled by, you know, varying um, the flow rate in or the flow rate out. Um, and the temperature of the tank could be controlled by, you know, the steam flow rate, for example. All right, so this first term, um, we also know that uh, from thermo du equals CV dt, so the volumetric heat capacity. Um, so we can replace this first term with M since it's constant times CV. And we're going to, again, we're going to assume CV is constant over the, the range of temperatures here. And then we have dt dt. Now keep in mind that these things, these first two terms, M and CV, they can change slightly, but we don't expect them to change very much. Um, as we're able to keep control of um, the level and the temperature, we don't expect it to fluctuate very much. Okay, so now the species coming in, we have um, FA naught times HA naught plus FS naught times HS naught. And I believe that's all. And then coming out, we have FA HA minus FB HB minus F. SO, so the uh, molar flow rate of the solvent is not going to change because it's not part of the reaction. And this is going to come out at, at, the at, the, at a different temperature. So I'm going to express that as the enthalpy of the solvent at the reaction temperature. And then we have plus UHA times TS minus T. So here we're looking, looking pretty good because now we have we look at our terms here. This term right here, we have it. That's our 
That's our independent variable. So we're looking at how our independent variable of temperature changes as a function of time. Um, the M and the CV in front of it are constant. We also have our independent variable over here. And then we expect the rest of these terms to be uh, fairly constant or constant, or we can't, we don't have control over the temperature of the, the steam. So now we need to take these rest of these terms and figure out how I can put those in terms of measurables. So um, let's see, let's look at, let's look at our, our solvent terms. So we can, we can go ahead and we can group our FSO terms. So we'll take these. So this term and this term minus HS, this is going to be our first term over here. Now, keep in, if we look at this term right here, this is a delta H. And we know that delta H equals CP delta T. And then in this case, maybe instead of writing a delta T like that, I'm going to write it. What is the actual delta T? It's T naught because that's the temperature of HS naught minus T, which is the temperature of the species coming out. So this first term now becomes FS naught times CP. And again, this is the intrinsic. Um, is heat capacity per per temperature per per mole and t zero minus t. So again, now we have this in terms of our uh, independent variable, and the rest of the terms here are constants. So our last task is now to figure out what to do with the rest of these terms, which is FAO um, HAO minus FAHA minus FBHB. Okay, so these are the terms that are involved in the reaction. All right, so from the stoichiometry of the reaction, I know that FAO equals FA plus FB. Right, and if I, the reaction stoichiometry were different, I could just vary this relationship because um, I can I can equate uh, the amount of species um, the amount of species B. That would come out based on the amount of species A that reacts. So in this case, I picked a fairly straightforward example to do. Um, so now I can rearrange this to get FA equals FAO, what is it, minus FB. And then what I'll do is I'll just, you know, kind of substitute this up in here into this equation. And so that'll give me up here FAO, HAO minus, okay, the first term is going to be FAO, HA. And then the second term is going to be plus, what is that, FB times HA. And then I have my last term minus FBHB. All right, and so now we can see some neat things here. This right here, it's again, it's going to be the same as what we did for the solvent. So this term is going to become FAO CPA times T0 minus T. And now this term right here, plus FB, and this um, is going to be, what is it, HA minus HB. And what do you know HA minus HB? This term right here, it's just the negative heat of reaction at the reaction temperature. So, and again, because we don't expect the reaction temperature to change very much, we expect it to stay constant, but fluctuate maybe a couple degrees, but we're keeping it close. Um, this term right here, we would expect this to be fairly constant. All right, so now let's let's put all this together. So we have our final form of the energy balance is going to be MCV times dt dt equals. All right, so we have our our first term, which is going to be because of the, the solvent. So FSO CP of the solvent, I should make sure that's the solvent, times T0 minus T. So this right here is the temperature change associated with heating up the solvent from the entering to the reaction temperature, plus FAO times CPA T naught minus T. So again, same thing as we take the species that's reacting and we raise it to the reaction temperature plus FB times HA minus HB. Oops, no, let me rewrite that. I meant we should write this as negative, let's do this one, negative heat of reaction. 
All right, so this is also, so again, FB is, is not a constant. So we need to put FB in terms of either measurables or we need to come up with a relationship for FB. So we could do either one of those, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that in terms of, of measurables. So we know from our, our mole balance, so we can look at um, the mole balance on species B. So for species B, we know that the rate of change of the number of moles of species B with respect to time is going to equal the amount of B that's entering, so FB0, but there's no B entering, entering so this term is 0, minus FB plus the rate of change of the moles of species B. And so we know from the reaction we're going to have, that's going to be, we have to go back and look at Let's go over to our, our system right here. We're given a reaction, but we're not given a reaction rate, and that would be important to know. So let's just assume right here we have a first order irreversible reaction where negative RA equals KCA, and this equals negative RB. So coming down to our species balance plus the rate of B, which would be KCA times V. So this is the reaction rate, um, Rb times volume. So moles per liter per time times the volume. So that gives us the rate of generation of species B. Um, so we also know that K, this reaction rate term, K can be a function of temperature. And if it's a strong function of temperature, uh, we can replace K with the Arrhenius equation such that K equals K naught exp negative ea over rt right and this gives us our you know we know that the temperature right here is our independent variable with the rest of these terms being constant so in this case right here um, we can solve for um we can solve for um, fb and again we have to make we have to make an assumption that because we're controlling things that the this term right here the net rate of uh, accumulation of species B, this isn't going to change very much relative to the amount of B that's forming from the reaction. Again, it's not zero, it can change, but but the effect of how much it's changing is negligible relative to how much B is being formed based on the reaction. So we can say that FB is going to be equal to this term right here. So write K naught EXP negative EA over RT times CAV. You know, it's probably reasonable to just say this term right here is constant, but I'm just going to keep that in there for now. So let's, let's see. When we now look at our full equation, we can just plug this term up into here. So let me just rewrite this quickly. And I want to talk about, and then we can talk about a couple aspects of it. So we have the solvent, the heat capacity of the solvent times difference in temperature of the reaction versus entering. We have this, the reactant that's entering, raise the temperature to the reaction conditions. And then we have plus the rate of formation of species, the, the, the temperature change due to the reaction. So this term right here tells us how much reaction is occurring. So this right here is as the reaction occurring, that's going to cause, be if, if it's an exothermic reaction, cause release of heat, and that's going to also increase um, the temperature. All right, so again, our final form of the energy balance on the process. All right, because now here, again, we do have we do have a reaction that's occurring. So we have T is our, uh, our main independent variable. This might be what we're trying to control for. Um, oh, let me also include on here, I left off our um, heat transfer term. So we also have plus UHA T steam minus T. There, now we have our complete energy balance. And I think, we also need the heat transfer term right here as well, T steam minus T, just to be entirely correct. 
Oops. All right, so what else do we need from here? So because now finally this term CA, this term can also change. Um, CA not can change, et cetera. So um, this, the, the amount of CA in the reaction is gonna affect our reactor temperature too. So we can write a balance. Um, and so let's just finish up with our, our dynamic model for our concentration. So for our, um, <clears throat> to get our, to get how our concentration of species A changes with respect to time, we just write the mole balance on species A. And again, this is gonna be, Let's, let's use the same pen. So we have DNA DT equals FAO minus FA plus RAV. And again, we know that NA equals CA times V, or concentration equals moles divided by volume. I just multiply volume through. Um, then again, we know that FAO equals the volumetric flow rate, I can write it as this term, or I can write it as FV. Some texts use different things. So let's just use FV times CAO. Um, I should have had the CAO here too. And then also FA equals FV times CA. So let's just replace those terms into here. And so now over here we have V times DCA DT equals FV times CAO, and both of these terms are constants or knowns, minus FV times CA, and this is my independent variable here, um, minus RA is KCAV. And then again, so in here we have our independent variables. Everything else is known. So now we have our, our two dynamic equations that represent the process. So Again, that shows generally how we can work through the energy balance and mole balances for reactive systems that involve, you know, heat transfer. Um, if it's isothermal, or if there is, if it's adiabatic, I should say, then we don't have to worry about Q. If there's cooling water, we need to treat that term a little bit different. Um, in some cases, we have multiple reactions, and we need we'll need additional independent equations for the other variables as well. We could write a dynamic model for the concentration of B with respect to time, but this is not needed. And the reason why it's not needed is because this is not independent from the concentration of species A. Um, so we'll stop there. Thanks for watching.